This is uh, sort of just a twist on a traditional French bread recipe. We're not going to take as much time as you would for a rise, but we're going to cheat that method by using a little bit hotter water than we normally would. So uh, normally you would use dry yeast and a good warm water and you'd let it sit with the sugar and then you'd let it rise for a long time, like an hour, and we're not going to do that. And so using a hot, hot water during the mixing process is going to help speed up the activation of the yeast and the whole process of uh, the rise is going to get speed up by that process. So I have some water coming to not a full boil, but I'm just heating up some water in my tea kettle so that I can use that as my hot water. Um, we want it to be anywhere between 120, 150 degrees. You want it to be hot, but not boiling water. So if you bring water to a boil, just make sure you kind of cool it back down a little bit before we start mixing. The first thing we need to do though is mix our yeast into the warm water. Now the warm water is sort of a little bit more tepid, like a hot bath. Well, I guess a really hot bath, about a 90 to 100 degree water. If you have a thermometer, then it's great to actually test the reading of your water. If not, then just go for like the hot water. The hottest that comes out of your faucet is probably going to be about 100 to 110. And then you can kind of use that or let it cool for a, a, a minute. Um, and then if you don't have a thermometer to test your hot, hot water, just bring it to a boil and then let it cool for about three minutes. And you should be okay. If you see little tiny bubbles in it, then you're hot enough. Um, I'm going to measure my yeast. Usually one packet of active dry yeast is one tablespoon. Yeah, and I just wanted to kind of make sure, because if it's a little bit less, then you, uh, you might need to get more or use a little bit different quantity just because you want it to be right. You want to be using a full tablespoon. So this is actually a little bit low. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so my package of yeast was just uh, a little bit less and sometimes that happens. So I'm gonna just bulk it up with some more, make sure that I have exactly two tablespoons of dry yeast. Make sure that's level. Okay, and I'm just doing that right into my measuring cup because then it can just mix with my water right in here. I don't have to get another thing dirty. As you all have heard me say many times, I, why waste the dishes? So I'm just going to use the hottest water that comes out of my faucet. I measured it earlier. It is at 100 degrees, so I'm good with that. And we just want a half a cup. It's a small amount. We just want the amount of water that it, we need to kind of activate this yeast, get it alive, get it uh, starting to wake up. We're going to let that sit in that warm water. I'm mixing it just a little bit because uh, since I put the yeast in first, you can sometimes just have like dry clumps that don't get uh, coated with the water and we don't want that. I want to make sure that everything gets nice and mixed in. So I'm just going to mix it a little bit. And I'm just going to set that aside for now. I'm going to let that come uh, do its thing, which is sort of, it's sort of feeding. It's kind of a, well, it's activating is what it's doing. It's helping it come back to life. Yeast is an act, a, a living, active thing. So um, we're trying to bring the life back out of it. The hot water helps to reinvigorate the yeast. And then we're going to mix all of our other ingredients, except you notice that the flour is divided. I put that in all caps because that's really important. I've known a lot of people to go quickly through a recipe and then they just dump in all six cups of the flour and that wouldn't really work. Um, you definitely want to follow the instruction of three cups at, uh, at the beginning and then we're going to add the final three cups one at a time. That really helps develop the gluten and uh, it kind of replaces some of the kneading process by uh, mixing it in this way. So this is our very like cheater kind of MacGyver method of making a quick bread, which is nice. It makes a really good product. So I think why not make it fast, right? So I'm mixing the rest of the ingredients right into my mixer bowl because then I can just put it right onto the mixer. Um, if you don't have a stand mixer, that's perfectly fine. You're just gonna use your shoulders and a little bit of elbow grease and a heavy spoon or a wooden, um, a wooden spoon, something with some weight to it so that you can kind of really mix that flour in. Because by the end, as we're mixing in the last three cups, you're going you're gonna to need to work it in. But you can totally do that by hand. We're not even kneading it in the machine. We're not even really kneading it. So you don't, um, you don't necessarily need to do it in the machine. Just 
follow the same steps, but using a, a, a good sturdy spoon or wooden spatula. Uh, okay, so our next ingredients, we're gonna be adding our two cups of hot water. I've got my big measuring cup here. I'm gonna use my water I got hot on the stove. This is still really hot. The steam is coming off of it. I'm gonna take the temperature of it just to make sure it's not gonna be overwhelming. Um, where did I do, 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 do? If you have a thermometer, like that's usually meant for meat, you just stick it into the water, any thermometer actually, a candy thermometer, um, any cooking thermometer that will read temperature, just go ahead and put that in the water. You don't wanna put it all the way to the bottom because then you'd be reading the temperature of the measuring cup in relationship with the water. You want it to be right in the middle. This is at about 150. I'm gonna wait just maybe a minute to add that in, but I'm gonna get the rest of the ingredients in here. So I want three tablespoons of sugar. Make sure that they're nice and level. You don't want them to be heaping tablespoons or else you're putting, first of all, too much sweetness flavor into the bread, but also, um, the sugar uh, and salt are important in terms of the ratio to the yeast. They help both feed and uh, slow down the yeast process. So the sugar helps to feed the yeast and the salt helps to slow down the yeast. So uh, if you put too much or not enough of one of those things, uh, it actually might change the science of the recipe a little bit. Um, so this has been worked out accordingly. So make sure that it's a good level tablespoon there. I'm using regular table salt for this, not the thick, crunchy kosher salt. If you have uh, sea salt, just use like the, the fine grain sea salt, not the big, uh, big coarse sea salt. That would also change the science because it's not, it's actually different uh, amount of salt. Um, just based on the size of the grain, the granules. Okay, so just one tablespoon of salt. We want five tablespoons of vegetable oil. If you have just a neutral canola oil, that's fine. That's basically the same thing. Um, I always, always, uh, if you just notice me doing that, you wanna smell your neutral oils. Um, they have a tendency, if you keep them in a warm place, like close to the oven, they can go rancid uh, quicker than you might think if you don't use it often enough. And so there's a, there's a really off-putting smell to it. It smells like dirty oil. Um, so if you smell oil and it's like, well, what is that kind of gnarly smell? Then your oil has probably gone rancid. And so don't use that. It will, it will taste that way in your food. Um, so just be careful of that. That's just a side note. Five tablespoons of this. One, two, three, four, five. And then I'm gonna do three cups of the flour because the other three are going to be added in later. Important to remember to divide that. I'm using um, regular white flour. If you wanted to make a whole wheat version of this bread, you would have to reduce the amount of flour by just a little bit. The ratio of whole wheat flour to regular flour is about, like one cup of white flour would be about three quarters of a cup of whole wheat flour. Um, it's a denser flour, so you don't need as much of it. Um, but there are also really good recipes for whole wheat flour out there that already started by using that, so you might just look that up instead. Um, but it would probably work if you just reduce the flour amount. It's a pretty standard-ish uh, ratio. So one, make sure that it's a level, even cup of flour. As usual, whenever you're measuring, you want your measurements to be correct, or else it will change everything. So I just use my hand. If you have like a, a the handle to a spoon or something, you can just kind of level it off. That's two. And great. I'm gonna add my hot water to this and I'm gonna get that mixing on the mixer. I'm gonna try to bring the camera back there with me so you can see what it looks like as it starts to kind of come together, what we're looking for here. Uh, okay. Just make sure I'm on track, mixing all of these things, and then we're gonna stir it well. I'm just going to stir it well 
on the stand mixer um, because then I don't have to wash another spoon. I can't tell you enough about the dishes. So, um, get this camera. Got my setup back here. I hope this will work. I want to make sure if you're using a mixer that you properly lock your bowl into place. Um, and I'm going to use the, it's called like a, a spill guard because the flour has a tendency to want to kind of fly everywhere at the beginning of the mixing process. Just check the camera. Yeah, you can kind of see in the bowl, right? Okay. So when you're using a stand mixer, if you have one at home, it's really important never to go from zero to 60 in one switch. Use your machine, go like one step up at a time. It will prolong the life of the engine of the machine. If you go from all the way on to all the way off or vice versa, it will really not, it will hurt the engine. So you just kind of one step up at a time to turn it on. You definitely want to make sure that you bring the bowl up. Obviously, that was the first thing that I needed to do. <laughs> there you go. You still see? Okay. So on, it's just gonna, all I'm doing now is just mixing this together. We wanna just make sure that all of these ingredients are mixed well, and then we're gonna be adding in our yeast water combo. It. We just kind of want to make sure that there are no like obvious chunks of a lot of extra dry flour that haven't been mixed in or um, yeah if it's just obviously like it's not well combined yet then you need to keep mixing but just until it's combined. Now I'm going to show you this. this is really fun. Um, I think let me see can you see down into there? Okay, hold on. Do, 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 do. Okay this is like foamy. That's what they call that. All that uh, scummy. It, it has risen. It has grown in size uh, more than like a little bit more than the half a cup. And it's all foamy and bubbly on top. That's what you're looking for. If it doesn't look like that yet, then your water might not have been warm enough. The yeast isn't like active enough. Maybe your yeast is really, really old. That can happen. Um, but uh, you might just need a little hotter water or let it sit, but that foaming action, that shows that it's really alive and it's really active. So we're ready to add this now into our mix here. I wanna make sure that I scrape all of this out of that measuring cup. If there's any yeast or even any yeasty water still in there, you have to get all of that out. Oh, sorry like all of it around the edges, you want every little last drop of that uh, yeast action. That's where all of our, uh, well, all of our good breadiness and the rise is gonna come from. So you make sure you scrape that out really well. So we're gonna mix that in. Um, yep, just until it's combined with this paddle attachment. And then we're gonna be adding the flour one cup at a time, three more cups of flour. Um, and then once that's all added and it's well mixed together, we're going to see a nice dough. Then we're going to let it sit for 10 minutes, just in the bowl. Um, then we're going to shape it, let it sit again. This is a whole, this is the quick process though. Like if we were making regular bread, we would be letting it sit for hours. So um, we're going to go one cup of flour at a time. Um, You'll notice as I get lower and lower in my flour container, I'm going to have to use probably a different scoop to get it out, just um, gonna become awkward. So in that case, I just recommend like using a smaller measuring cup or a scoop to do it in, or you can pour your flour out, whatever is easiest for, for you. Just kind of don't struggle, make it work. Uh, I'm gonna add in that one cup of flour, mix this together. This process of adding the flour, like I said, one cup at a time and then letting it mix is duplicating a little bit of the kneading process. French bread doesn't require as much kneading as other doughs because it's not a really glutinous dough. We're not trying to really activate a lot of gluten in it. Um, if you wanted a really 
crumb cheese dough or a lot of crumb or a lot of uh, air holes and stuff like that, then you would really work in more gluten to make it more of an elastic dough. We're just making a good country French bread here, so we don't we don't need to do all of that. Okay, that one cup is mixed in well. I can see there's no more dry bits or empty like uh, areas that haven't gotten well combined. I'm gonna move down to a smaller scoop. That just means I have to add in two of these. This is a half cup. Makes it easier for me to get it out of my jar here. So that is another cup. We're gonna have that mix. <laughs> You don't need to turn it up very high at this point. You definitely don't want the flour to fly all over your face or your kitchen. It's not very easy to clean up. And uh, it's just trying to combine. If As you're doing this more, you'll see that it's pulling the dry flour away from the sides of the bowl and it's kind of incorporating it all in itself. If it doesn't do that and there's any patches of dry flour, you just make sure that you kind of scrape it down with a spatula or a bowl scraper. And we're just gonna add our last final cup of flour here. It's starting to look very much like a dough, starting to kind of form a ball around the paddle attachment in the middle of the bowl. So it's forming a nice uh, dough ball on itself. And last, there we go, half a cup. So that makes a total of three cups that we've added now, one at a time. I'm going to mix this, start it slow. And then once the flour incorporates a little bit, so it's not flying all over the place, then you can turn it up, maybe one. see it is now definitely in a dough form and it's starting to pull itself around the ball of uh, the bowl. I can see there's a little bit still dry flour like crummy texture at the very bottom of the bowl so I want to just let this kind of try to pick that up by itself. Yep which it's doing because it's a sticky wet dough so it's going to pick up all of that dry flour. That's it. I and I'm going to literally just lower this uh, and gently kind of pull it off of the uh, paddle attachment. But that's pretty much it. Um, I do you kind of want to make sure the bottom has gotten? Yep. Yep. Okay. So that just needs to sit in this bowl for the next ten minutes. 320, good. Um, we're just, it needs to uh, rest. What we're doing now is letting all of the, um, well, we, we stretched the dough, we've combined all the ingredients, we've actually created kind of a stiff, uh, glutinous texture. And so you kind of need to let it relax now a little bit. Um, so it will become, oh, easier for us to work with uh, so that we can then shape it into our doughs. So we let it sit here for about 10 minutes. You see I haven't like done anything to it. It's still just kind of in a in this uh, rough uh, ball in the middle that was shaped by itself, kind of brought itself together. Um, I do have what we call a bowl scraper. They are these um, really, really awesome tools if you get into baking a lot more, which I hope that you are inspired to do, especially bread making. These are really, really handy to using these kitchen bowls or other mixing bowls. You don't have to worry about a handle. Um, a lot of the time, these types of spatulas with the handle, because of like the, well, the physics of it, they're just not as stable or strong. This, all you have is the paddle itself. And so you can really get in there and it bends, it's flexible, so it shapes to the side of the bowl itself. And you can um, really, really uh, just get all your dough well scraped together. It's, it's a handy tool for bakers. So I recommend if you get more into baking, 
They're uh, very affordable. You can get them in packs online. Uh, question, where do I get it? So if you don't have a kitchen supply store that's near you, um, and they're probably not all open right now, which is fine, but I would recommend first looking for like a local shop that is maybe doing online ordering because then you can support a local business and there are a lot of restaurant supply or uh, kitchen supply and baking supply stores. There's Gloria's in LA, they definitely sell those. Um, there's Bargain Fair near Fairfax, they sell those. But uh, Amazon definitely has them or any of those online retailers you can get. They're just, they're literally called bowl scrapers for scraping bowls. Uh, and then there's something called a bench scraper, which is the metal hard, not flexible version of that. And that is, we're gonna use a little bit later. It can really scrape your surface if you get a lot of dry flour or things like that, or when you're making a wet dough um, and you don't wanna keep getting it stuck to your fingers, you can use this to kind of keep scraping and folding the dough. So bench scraper and bowl scraper, really, really handy baking tools if you're gonna get more into making dough, which I hope you do, because it's really fun. Making bread is one of the most fun things that you can do, um, especially in baking, because it's sort of that great crossover of art and science. Um, once you've got the science part of it down, then the art of making it taste great and adding in ingredients and uh, making it look beautiful and slicing it just right, all those kinds of things are really fun. So baking bread is, um, one of the coolest things you can do, also one of the most ancient things that we do in terms of making food. Uh, there are a lot of anthropologists, people who theorize that bread and or beer, not sure which came first or why civilizations started to develop around each other. Um, so yeast is incredibly important to human humans in general um, and uh, tastes great. So there's different yeasts. Obviously there's uh, instant yeast, which just means it's already been kind of activated a little bit for you. You don't have to feed it or wait as much or use super hot water. You can just kind of pour it all into your bread maker. Uh, this is the middle ground active dry. So it's been dried, but it's kind of ready to go. You just need to wake it back up. And then there's uh, fresh yeast, which is not dried out and it's kind of comes in a little brick form. And that is usually used in like commercial baking in big places or fancy French restaurants, things like that. Uh, it has a really ripe, yeasty flavor and quality. You don't have to feed it or waken it up or, or anything. You just bake with it. So there's recipes that are made specifically to use those kinds of yeasts. Don't just try to like replace one for the other. It won't, it won't work. Um, but if you have access to getting fresh yeast, if you ever see that in a store, then I really, I recommend using it. It's really fun. We only use that in culinary school for a lot of our bread making. Um, so a lot of those old French recipes, they call for fresh yeast. And it's, it smells amazing. It's interesting. Uh, it's kind of like one of those bad good smells. I don't know if you understand that, but there you go. Um, we just have about four more minutes to let this sit. What we're going to do is um, separate it into three different pieces. This is where you can be creative. If you want to make French bread, Boules, which is what we call the round loaves, which is literally French for ball. You can have a boule of a loaf. You can have a more of a baguette, which is the long stick. Uh, French bread usually is kind of in a, like a long but not skinny pointy loaf. So a baguette would be long and skinny and pointy. We're gonna make kind of more of a French bread loaf, classic traditional. It's what you see like the garlic bread comes in that shape and size. So. That's what we're going for, but if you want um, to practice or play, then you have enough dough here to work with. I, I highly encourage you to make maybe one, make a round one, maybe make one a long one, and I can show different shapes here. So uh, if you wanted to play around with shape, you can do that. I'll show you how. If you were doing this by hand, you would do that same method that I did. You would just be doing it by hand, so you would mix your ingredients in the bowl, add in your yeast water, add in your first cup of flour, go to town, make sure that you're bringing it all together. Second batch of flour is gonna become stiffer and harder to mix, but all that you keep doing is just making sure that flour gets uh, worked in really well. And then by the third cup, switch arms so that you get your arm day, you get your workout for the day, but um, 
it's just going to take elbow grease, but you'll definitely get it to this point where the dough itself is just sort of dragging around the bowl, picking up all of that flour and dragging it around. You can even get your hands in there and kind of give it a little knead to make sure that you fold it in all of the dough, um, just because the machine kind of did that for us, but not necessarily to, to actually knead it on the board. You don't have to do that. Just make sure that you're mixing it really stiffly and hard to incorporate it really well. Um, but you can absolutely do this dough by hand um, if you don't have that mixer. Some people do it in a food processor with the blades, but you use the plastic blades instead of the metal sharp blades. Uh, a lot of food processors come with that and it's actually called the dough blade. Um, it will cut the flour into your dough more than it will knead the flour into your dough. So you might actually need to knead it a little bit at that point if you were using a food processor, but it might make the mixing a little easier if you have that plastic hook. So there's a lot of different ways that you can try to make bread without having to hurt your arms terribly, but um, also without having to spend, you know, the money on a KitchenAid if you don't have one. So uh, don't let that scare you away from baking you know, just because you don't have a mixer. I didn't have one for most of my career learning how to bake. Um, so if you can learn how to do it the hardest way, then you can do it anyway after that. I think that's kind of my motto for most things. So, uh, yeah, we're just about a minute away. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll this out on my board. I've got a clean cutting board. If you have a countertop that's like um, all one surface, like a wood countertop or a stainless steel, or even if it's tile but big tile, that's great. I just have these small tiles with the grout in the middle, and I don't like to make dough right on that surface. It's uneven. The flour gets stuck in the grout. It's not fun. So I just use a clean big cutting board and um, I definitely need to put flour out for that though. You were, our dough is still sticky enough that when uh, you touch it and when it touches the, the board, it's going to be tactile. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stick. It's going to be a little tacky. So you kind of want to just a little sprinkle of flour. We're not trying to add a lot of flour to our dough, but you don't want it to stick. So. I'm going to, just using my hands, hold the dough, remove it completely from the blade, the uh, paddle. And then I'm going to just tip the dough out onto uh, my cutting board using my bowl scraper to make sure that I'm getting all of the good wet dough out. If there's any, um, so you can see in my bowl uh, around the edges, there's still what I would say, like a little bit of dough. And if anybody has heard me talk before about scraping all of your stuff out to make sure you get all of your love and all of your ingredients and all of your money, that's really important in almost all forms of baking. But this is now really dry around the sides of the bowl. It's very, very dry and crusty. And I don't want to put that into my nice wet dough here. So any of those little bits that are, that feel extra dry, like they're, kind of crispy, don't scrape those off and put them into your bread. Uh, it's just, you don't want that stuff. Question. Um, if it's just a little bit more wet, then I would, I would add, go ahead and put a little bit more flour on your board than I am and put plenty of flour on your hands if you need to. Um, and just keep adding it as you shape it and that will help. Um, this is, it's still pretty wet, but um, but yeah, it shouldn't it shouldn't be like horrible. So if it looks a lot wetter than this, then maybe uh, um, did you get all of the flour? It was three cups at the beginning, and then three cups again in the end. Uh, and then if not, I guess this is the part where you can add more flour. You can kind of just make sure that it dries itself out on your board or on your hands. Um, so I am going to do that. I'm going to put a little bit of flour on my hands just to make sure that my it doesn't stick too, too much. I'm going to just gently kind of make this into one uh, rough, loose shape so that I can evenly, as evenly as I want to, divide it. If you were working in a bakery, you would get a little scale out and you would weigh each measurement to make sure they were all the same. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it into thirds. I'm using my uh, bench scraper to cut it, but you can just use a knife, any knife, like a butcher's knife or a steak knife, or um, you can even just kind of find that spot and then 
tear it with your hands or just cut it uh, with kitchen shoe, like anything would do. You don't have to have that to cut the dough. It just makes it a little easier because I have it here. So I've got three generally equal uh, balls of dough here. If you want to make one into a bowl, which is the round ball, you would pinch, um, pinch a bunch of the dough together on one side, creating a nice smooth side on the other. And you're creating the seam here by pinching it all together really tightly. And then you're gonna flip it over onto that seam side and turn it. I'm, I'm using my hands kind of in a chop motion, but I'm going underneath the dough a little bit, tightening it up on the bottom as I spin it plus the friction of the dough against the board is tightening it up. What we're doing is kind of helping to extra seal that seam on the bottom so that when it bakes, it doesn't uh, just open up into a weird shape. So that's your bowl. You've got just a nice ball of dough. I'm gonna leave one in that shape. Uh, if you want to do like a traditional baguette, what you would do is starting from the middle, you would start to roll it back and forth, gently pressing down with your hands as you pull outward towards the sides. You're just kind of gently rolling it back and forth, putting ever so slight pressure down on your hands, stretching the dough out towards the outer edge. I am not worried about like perfect shape here. I'm not worried about, um, anything really <laughs> because this is rustic french bread this is like this is people bread this isn't patisserie bread this is just what you would make out at the farm stand uh you know in the morning for your meals for the day quick breads so super simple if you wanted to make that cute baguette like pinched end you can do that literally by just shaping it into a pointy pinched end you can manipulate the dough basically into whatever shape or look you want. The most important thing is if there are any seams or folds, that that goes on the bottom when we bake it. So you're gonna put these onto a greased um, sheet pan if you have pan spray, or I'm using my silicone uh, baking thing. If you have parchment, that would be fine too, but maybe a little bit of spray on the parchment would help as well. Um, uh, you just don't want, the French bread we wanna get kind of a, a uh, a hard crust and if the dough uh, sticks to the pan as it bakes it might get a little bit of steamy we don't want to have any soggy bottoms here on our bread so we're going to get a uh, pan spray will help it from getting too soggy but it'll also um, just make sure that you don't stick and burn throughout the process so this one I'm just going to make actually kind of more of the rustic traditional French bread just rolling this out, it's gonna be very rustic, which is good. If you do have any odd lines or shapes, you can just, you fold it and then create a seam. And then that seam becomes your underside. And that's it. So, these are, Rustically shaped, but that's how we like it. Want to make sure that there's enough room for all of them. They are going to rise in the oven and actually right here. So we are not covering them. We want these to rise uncovered for about 20 minutes in a warm place. The back of my oven here is the warmest spot. And I'm going to turn the oven on now to 375 degrees. So that's going to make this back area even warmer. It's gonna create a nice, um, well, a nice uh, sort of sauna area without the moisture for our yeast to keep uh, getting more active, keep coming to life, and it's gonna to start to soften the dough up and start to create the rise now. Uh, la, 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 la. We wanna score it. And it says we can brush it now with the beaten egg. You can do that now or you can do that right before it goes into the oven, actually. Um, and if you don't want to put egg in your bread or on your bread, you don't have to. It's just that's how you get that really nice um, 
uh, what am I gonna call it, sort of honey golden brown color on that, on the top of the French bread loaf. So if you really want that traditional honey brown color, then giving it an egg wash is gonna help. Um, you don't have to though. You can also, some, uh, some people brush different breads with like a little bit of olive oil and sprinkle salt on. Some people would wait until later in the baking process and then give it a wash with, um, well, like an egg wash and then stick on some sesame seeds or different things like that. You can do all kinds of different uh, things, but like I was saying, that traditional kind of dark honey brown color that you have on a French bread loaf, that's, you get that by adding an egg wash. So a very simple egg wash is just one egg, uh, cracked and beaten very well. Um, I am looking for a small mole, here we go. Cracked and beaten really, really well so that when you brush it on the top, we don't have any um, like separate egg yolk or egg white. You want to make sure that it's uh, just beaten egg. Um, and then when it says score it, you want to use either, if you have a really sharp regular knife, uh, that'll work, but a, a serrated knife is a great option. That's what I'm going to use. I'll show you. Um, or if you have, it's like a razor blade that they make for scoring dough. Um, we actually in culinary school just use razor blades. So we kept razor blades in our kitchen kit, which is, if anybody had like opened up and searched our equipment, that would have been maybe confusing, just a stack of razor blades. But it was for that purpose, for scoring the top of bread dough. And a very well beaten egg is going to, uh, give us that nice color, but if we had separate yolk or separate white, then we're going to just have like cooked egg whites on top of our bread, and we don't want that. So make sure it's very well mixed, and then using any kind of brush, just kind of glaze the top of the loaf and the baguette. Here, I'll put this here so you can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna go down to the sides where it meets the pan, but I'm not worrying about the bottom at all. That's gonna just get uh, toasted on the bottom and it'll be whatever color it's gonna be. But for this nice golden, brush it all over the top. Let this drip all the way down the sides, all over the bowl. If you, uh, don't do it evenly. You will actually be able to see the brush strokes, um, like or where where the line draws. So if you don't go all the way down to the bottom, like where it meets the pan, then you'll be able to see the the dividing line of where you painted on the egg and where you did it. But it doesn't matter. Just uh, so you know, after baking, it's like, whoa, why is that part all white? Probably you missed it with a little bit of the egg. There, so nice and coated. And then I'm gonna use my uh, nice, small, sharp, serrated knife. You kind of, you need to be direct about scoring bread. You can't be timid. You, you do wanna use force, but it's really more about the initial force and then the pull. It's very quick. Um, and some people have different techniques, but this is just what works for me. So I try to, Find where I want to do it. I'm just going to score this bowl twice across the top here, pretty big. I'm going to go in, and then you just kind of, you're like you're cutting it. Like I don't know, it's not a nice thing to say, but like you're you're cutting it open. Um, so kind of forceful. You want it to go deep enough that it opens it up during the baking process, and so that it helps release steam as it bakes. Uh, and that's it. So I've got my nice scores. Um, you can do patterns. You can do designs. Some people score in things like leaves or um, stars or different kinds of things. You can write your name in it if that's what makes you happy. Uh, scoring bread is fun. And, and the more you practice, then the like, more creative you can be with what you put into it. And a lot of artisan bread makers score the most beautiful images on top of their bread. Um, I don't, 
I don't have enough practice with that these days, but that's something fun to try if you want. You could do like, um, you could make one of these like into a little uh, wheat leaf or something by just scoring a few small ones off the side, you know, and we'll just sort of see how things bake up. You can kind of, uh, you can cross over some of these so that it'll be a fun look. You can go the other way um, to create designs. You just kind of have fun, but you don't need to cut it open. You don't want your whole bread to be open and exposed. You're just trying to create some openings for the, the steam, like I said, um, as it bakes, or else it will, uh, the steam will try to escape out of the seams out of the bottom, and so then it'll distort the shape of your bread. Um, which is also fine in the end because it'll still taste great. But uh, you don't want, if you want your loaves to look like how they look, then score the top and the air will come out through those scores rather than trying to explode their way out the bottom. So those just need to sit. Um, they would, they would want to sit for probably another like five to 10 minutes, but I'm going to put them in the oven because I want them to get close to being done before our class is over. Um, so you would probably, if you're making yours, let it rise for just a little bit longer. You want it to rise in a warm spot for the full 20 or so minutes. Um, but just because it's going to bake for about 20 minutes, I want to, uh, we're gonna be really tight on time. Um, I've been chit chatting a little bit too much. The, um, fun thing though is that once it's in the oven, it just is really about that 20 minutes. Check it at like 15 if you need to spin your tray around. Most ovens, as we've talked about, are not even, so give it that 180 so that you have a nice consistent heat on either side of your tray, front and back, left to right. Um, but also just checking it at 15 because, uh, let's say you made slightly smaller or skinnier loaves, they'll actually bake faster. Um, that boule might take longer because it's a little denser in the middle than the baguettes will. We'll just kind of have to check it and see. What we're mostly looking for, the most important thing when it comes out of the oven is that it is, um, well, nice and golden brown and browned all the way uh, across. And uh, the bottom, obviously use like a towel or an oven mitt but you want to lift the bread up or flip it over and tap the bottom of the bread. If it sounds hollow, it's like you're tapping on something that is, uh, well, not dense or like solid through the middle. It kind of, it will, it sound hollow. Um, and that's what you're looking for for bread that is finished. Um, that means that all of that raw, dense dough has baked off and all of the air has gone away and it's just a nice, um, loaf of bread, that's what you'll be left with. Um, and the, the, the baking part is really the quickest part. It should only take about 15 to 20, 20 minutes, depending on the size of the loaves that you made. So hopefully this works out just in time that I'll be able to at least show you what you're looking for in the end. Um, what was I gonna say? I have a couple of things that might help as you keep baking from home, because I really do hope that you all do that. Um, I know that finding some ingredients is still a little bit hard right now at some stores. Uh, I do really encourage you to go outside of the box and start shop at stores that are a little bit less uh, mainstream just because they actually have not been wiped out as much. Um, and they have sometimes ingredients that you wouldn't necessarily look for also in, uh, in a neighborhood that's not, um, not as populated with other people who are maybe baking bread every day like like you are like you know think think about looking at a different shop in a different neighborhood they might have different ingredients that you can't find in yours but the i think most fun thing um one of the kind of bonuses about things that have been happening lately during the quarantine period is restaurants who are struggling desperately to make ends meet um, have turned themselves into little marketplaces because they have wholesale access to ingredients and they can provide it to customers. And so the bakery that I used to go to in Echo Park that I really love getting um, 
croissants from, they sell eggs and yeast and five pound bags of flour that they measure out of their giant 25 pound bags of flour and they sell it online. You can get it on Caviar or Postmates. Um, so if you're ordering your BLT or your croissants or your coffee, like check out your local bakeries. I bet a lot of them are selling ingredients to help themselves make, make ends meet, but also to provide um, a service to the community because they know that stores are running out of yeast. They know that stores are running out of flour. They know that things are um, kind of being slowed down on the back end for grocery stores to restock, but the bakeries still have wholesale access. So they are, they, they have no shortage of supplies to flour and yeast and other kind of baking goods. And that goes the same for other ingredients at other restaurants. Um, there's a wine bar near me that is no longer a wine bar. They do still sell wine by the bottle, but you can now get cheese and butter and eggs and fresh produce from the farmer's market from this wine bar. And uh, it's keeping the wine bar afloat. Uh, and it means that they can have a couple employees come in every week and means that those people can maybe pay their rent. So a little bit goes a long way in helping the local economy if you can. Uh, if you are looking for basic ingredients, my yeast and my flour from the bakery cost the same as it would from the store. They're not trying to price gouge. They're just trying to uh, be a service and make a little bit of money. So um, I think it helps everybody in the long run. So that's a resource. Check your neighborhood, check bakeries, check restaurants, ask local cafes if they are selling ingredients or if they know of anyone who is selling ingredients. I find most of those resources on Instagram. A lot of the restaurants and cafes and chefs in the area are um, publicizing things that they're doing on their Instagram account. So you can find things like that. You can even search um, on LA Weekly or what is it, LA is the list site, like um, uh, of local LA restaurants in your neighborhood that might be selling things. And I bet you'll find something. So if you can't find something at the store, there's an option for trying to find some other things. Uh, do I recommend using oil on your hands so the dough doesn't stick? No. Uh, I definitely recommend flour. Um, the oil, you're going to add too much of a different amount of fat content to the bread. Um, we, I guess you could like limit the oil you put into the dough and then use some of that to help coat it. But then the outside of your bread is gonna be a very different texture. Um, that's, that's sort of more of how you would treat like a focaccia, uh, which is a really easy, fun dough to make. I highly recommend looking up different focaccia recipes. They are fun and quite simple. Um, they're very forgiving, you don't have to uh, do anything really that fancy. In fact, you get to kind of beat it up with your fingers and do all that kind of fun stuff. Ciabatta is less simple, but uh, actually it's still a pretty simple, ciabatta is basically like an Italian French bread. It's, it's a little bit different of a crumb though, and so you, uh, but it is a very wet dough, wetter than this. Um, there's there's a lot that are kind of difficult to deal with and some encourage you to use oil on your hands to keep it from sticking just because they have a good amount of oil in the bread and you want them to have an oily exterior, but you don't really want this dough to have an oily exterior as much. Um, so I wouldn't, I would definitely just keep to the flour on your hands that should do the job. Uh, and if you, and if it's really, really super sticky, like way stickier than what I just dealt with, then I think there might have been an issue with the flour measurement. And so you definitely want to add flour in the mixing process. So hopefully that helps uh, also keep it from sticking. So, but yeah, oil would change the consistency of the exterior of the bread. Um, I don't think it would be bad. I just think that it wouldn't be French bread. So it's not really what, what we're going for on this one. Normally at this time, I would also be telling you what we were going to be making next week, but um, uh, we're going to be taking a break. I know that we will be doing summer programming and I will announce what those are as soon as I know what they are. Um, we should have more of that information locked down by the end of this week. So I will make those announcements both on our website and on our Instagram page. Um, and. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely 
leaning towards baking being one of the options that we're going to continue doing through the summer. Um, just sort of depends on other sort of input and things right now. So we will uh, let you know. Um, if we do get into baking for the summer, then it's, it probably won't be progressively building off of this course. Um, just because we might have some new people joining us, it'll be a kind of a new program for the summer. So we would be going back and doing a couple more like simple baking recipes again and, and learning some methods, but not the same recipes. I won't be duplicating any of the same recipes just because those are already resources. Those videos are already available. So um, we will always be doing new recipes. So if you do sign up for any of our programming, don't be afraid of making the same blueberry muffins. I wouldn't do that to you, I promise. Um, so uh, I hope that you're you know, interested and encouraged and uh, just keep checking us out. And in the meantime, if there's a, a couple weeks where we don't have any programming, then please just keep baking, please keep cooking. Um, and I will still be here if you have any questions or any concerns or you find some flour and want to figure out how to use it. Uh, there's a lot of really cool ancient flours. There's a lot of cool uh, mixes and like gluten-free flours. There's, there's a lot of really fun things that you can play with when baking. And so I just encourage you to keep playing with your food as much as you can. Getting to that point where I want to, oh, 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 you guys. You guys, okay. Now I don't have the color that I want and I'm nowhere near at the like finished consistency that I want, but I am more than halfway there and you can see the double of size that I've achieved here on my loaves and how it's, the splits are opening up nicely. You can see the inner crumb. I am very pleased with this. So right at the last minute, I'll pull that out and we'll see um, how we're doing. A new towel, isn't that cute? Oops, Daisy. Friend gave me that, love that. Tea towels are such a nice thing. It's such a weird thing to collect, but there you go. Um, I'm sure everybody has something fun that they have in their kitchens. Um, if anybody does have any ideas or uh, anything that you would really, really love to see us do, whether it's this summer or as we start to build programming for the fall, please let me know. Um, I know a lot of you have been uh, joining me here in my apartment for a couple of months now and it's lovely. So um, I'm gonna miss doing this every Tuesday, um, but we will have something start soon. So we'll just start a new rhythm. And uh, so look for those announcements, look for those emails. I will, I'll try to email the regular group of people too once we know, just so that you can all find out as soon as possible. Um, but in the meantime, keep playing. Like I said, um, more and more of our videos are being uploaded to the website, so keep checking those. Uh, I have been uploading our recipes as quickly as I can to a recipe catalog, which is also on our website. So you can go there and access the recipes themselves and just print them out and make them at home if you didn't get any of the past emails. And let's see, any other resources? Um, well, in addition to these baking classes, all of the other classes we've been doing, like the breakfast, the kids cooking, the family, um, the weeknight meals, and any of the offshoot classes that I've done, like the dorm friendly cooking class we did last week, um, those are all gonna be uploaded if they haven't been already. So the, the library is vast. You guys, you could cook and bake all summer long and pretend that I'm there with you. <laughs> um, and then I am still here with you. So if you do need anything, like I said, uh, don't hesitate. Um, I have people ask all the time, I'm at the supermarket, I can't find this, what can I use instead? And if I can, if I'm available to help you, I'll, I'll help you. Uh, if I'm not, then I'll answer you later on and hopefully you figured it out. <laughs> um, if there are any other questions, oh good. Yes, your bread is going to come out perfect. Erin, I'm so excited for your dinner. I'm very jealous of your dinner. That sounds incredible. If you guys haven't read that in the chat, spaghetti squash. Oh, I'm jelly. That sounds fun and delicious. Um, I love making things that are like fun to make and fun to learn about. And yeah, if any of you watching have not played with or made or had spaghetti squash, jump on that bandwagon. It's a fun, it's a fun one. That's really cool. 
Um, yeah, please send me pictures. If you make the bread, if you make anything through the summer, send me pictures. Um, I haven't been posting on our Instagram this week very much. Uh, There's just a lot of stuff going on in the world, but um, we are definitely always loving the pictures and they're gonna get posted. So uh, uh, please send me them. It makes me feel like a proud hen, you know? It's like all my little babies are out there cooking. It makes me feel good. We're so close on that, I have to stop opening the oven because that lets the heat out, but I'm being impatient. Like I used to be, I worked at this bakery and the boss yelled at me so much about opening the oven too many times. I can hear his voice in my head right now. Um, how long can you keep the dough? Um, like if you make the dough but then don't bake it? I'm a little, I don't think I'm understanding the question exactly. Patty, if you could, uh, oh, well, okay. If you make the dough but then don't bake it, you can cover it and put it in the refrigerator um, and that will uh, slow down the rising process. In bakeries, they actually call it retarding the dough. Uh, it's, I guess the only time that you can still use that word and that still makes me feel gross to say that, but you retard the dough, you slow down the rising process by putting it in the refrigerator and keeping it very cold, wrapped very tightly. It will though continue to rise. So if you don't wanna bake it right away, put it in the fridge, wrap it really tight, and then you could bake it the next day. Um, like an overnight refrigerator rise will basically mimic a one hour out of the refrigerator rise. So you can do an overnight refrigerator rise on it, but then you will have to bake it the next day. It, it does, the dough doesn't just sit forever because it's yeast. It's gonna continue to grow. It's gonna continue to feed itself. And um, there are pictures online of a bakery in New York that threw away a bunch of dough because it, it actually, something in it was bad but the yeast continued to thrive and the dumpster eventually overflowed and exploded with dough. Um, so it will continue to just live. So you can't just, you can't just leave it forever. You have to kind of bake it. But a one, one night in the refrigerator wrapped very tightly, will, um, that will, that, that'll be good enough and then you could bake it the next day. Um, that would work actually fine. Um, I do have another recipe for a simple uh, yeast bread that is specifically designed to sit in the fridge overnight. So if you would rather have that or make that bread, let me know. I, I'd be happy to email you a different recipe. Um, if it's something about time or planning or things like that. Um, okay, just because we are down now to the last of it. What you're looking for uh, is this kind of golden honey brown that's starting to show up on like the most exposed edges. You want that all the way uh, across the dough. But to know that it is done, most importantly, I'm just going to gently turn it over. See, I would want this to be a little bit more round also, but I don't think the sound, no, the sound on that phone doesn't work. Let me see. I don't know if you can hear that. It kind of sounds like you're tapping on, um, like an empty ball. Uh, yeah. Ah, I wish I could like add a close up microphone. This is gonna go for about five more minutes in my oven and it's gonna be perfect. I'm gonna get that really nice honey brown all the way across the top and I'm gonna get an even harder tapping sound on the bottom, which is perfect. But um, we are at now technically four o'clock. So that is, uh, if you need to go, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for taking part in these classes. If you don't need to go, I'm not going to end the meeting until the bread is done. So uh, you can hang out with me for a few more minutes. Otherwise, I will post the final picture of it on our Instagram account so you can see it in all of its glory. If you do have to go, I understand. Um, or you can check out the Zoom meeting later on because I will, like I said, I'll leave this on until the bread comes out so that it is in the finished recording and so everyone can see it. Um, if there are any other questions in the meantime, I'm uh, happy to answer them because like I said, I'm gonna wait for this to, to finish. Uh, we're so close that I don't want it to not be in the video if it can be in the video. Um, but in basically an hour, 
it will take you just an hour if you don't have me just talking the whole time. Uh, and basically an hour you can have three nice big loaves of French bread. Great for dinner, great, amazing, like Aaron says, really, really great idea to have that with um, like Italian food, some meatballs, like turn this into garlic bread. Um, we made shrimp scampi in our weeknight meals this last Thursday. This bread with that shrimp garlic combo would be heaven, just heaven on a plate. Um, so there's a lot of different combinations. This would be really great. It's just also really great bread. Uh, I like to have little small pieces of French bread toast in the morning if you have some fancy butter. Sometimes I make bread just to be a vessel for butter because treat yourself in life. Butter is worth it. I love butter and I, I, I don't spend money on a lot of things, but I do, I get the good butter. You get that good Vermont butter or the French creamery butter or something like that. And it's just, I'm sorry, I'm getting very happy about butter. I love butter. I'm made up of like 80% butter, I think. Most people are water, butter. Um, I think it keeps me young and happy. <laughs> uh, Oh yeah, I really think that we're gonna have baking be one of the summer options. I can't promise anything, and so please don't like put that in stone and say and tell everyone that I said we're doing baking for sure. But if it's up to me and uh, however many courses that we can offer, I really, really am gonna do my best to make sure baking is one of them because I think that it's an important skill. I think that it's fun for people. I think it can be really um, a release from the rest of our lives, and I think it can provide a lot of uh, good for your home and your family and I love baking it's my favorite I started out as a baker and so I'm going to just be a little bit selfish and I want to teach baking I just want to keep baking with you guys so if I if I have any say in it if I can twist any arms we will have baking this summer uh, and then the other one that I really, I really do want to continue the family and kids cooking I think that that's a great opportunity for kids to have something to do all summer I have a lot of fun with them um, I have a lot of fun with them. They're just, uh, their passion for it and their excitement for it makes me feel, I remember why I got into it. And they're like, there's this kid, he's eight years old and his, his excitement for the things that he knows how to do now, it's like, and we all get to be a part of that as this little community, so it's really fun. So the kids and the baking are my priorities and then if we get any more after that, just keep your fingers crossed for us, you know? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, the color starts to change pretty quickly. I'm gonna give it one more turn and I think that maybe two minutes and we're gonna have some perfect French bread. Um, my oven is extremely un uneven and uncalibrated. For 375, I have to turn it to 400. And the back corner is where all of the heat is. I think my entire building is falling down in this general direction. Uh, if I were to put like a marble on this side of the room, it would just go whoosh, all the way to that side. It's like a sinking ship. Um, and I think that the heat in the oven actually reacts to that. Like it, the, the whole room is on a tilt and, and a lot of heat just kind of pools in that one area. I'm not sure if that's how like thermodynamics work, but it, it works in my head. So uh, yeah, I need to constantly turn everything in my oven, constantly. And if you have watched any of my recipe of the week videos, you've maybe seen the inside of my oven. I keep a pizza stone. It's just a big round tile stone, um, untreated, unglazed. Uh, it's just a safe, food safe stone that you can make pizza directly on and it kind of mimics the, the bottom of a wood fired pizza. But Mostly I just leave it in my oven all the time, 24 seven, it never comes out anymore. And it helps spread out a more even consistent heat because the stone heats up and it maintains its heat and it stays nice and warm and hot. And it kind of keeps the oven at a good, uh, even consistent heat a little better than it, it does without. It, it helps my oven and I don't know, some people keep like a brick in their oven, that's old school farmer method, but it, it's for the same reason that uh, the, the clay helps to um, just keep the heat constant, keep it going, and keep it kind of even spread throughout the whole little room. Um, any other questions? Oh, good. Uh, let's see. Yes, 
you guys, can you see that really nice color? I'm gonna get you a little closer here. Really nice like shop window, honey color. Good splits that opened up. I wanna show. Very hot, don't do that. Yeah. So I don't know if you can tell the difference from how it was before. When I flipped it over before, it looked almost like an opaque white, and now I've got um, more of a tan color. You can see it was all this color white, and now it's starting to get this nice golden brown color. And it will continue cooking on this tray for the next 10 minutes. And then I'm going to put it on a rack to let it finish cooling all throughout. And uh, oh man, yeah, it sounds nice and hollow. It sounds really good. Very excited. I also, uh, people ask me, what do you do with all that food? I will not be eating this bread. Don't, I'm not crazy. Um, I will keep uh, like half of one of these loaves and then I donate the rest to family and friends who can't go out and shop for themselves. So. Everybody's helping everybody. I hope that yours turned out. I hope it turns out if you go to make it. Um, oh, you can kind of see here. I don't know, this needs to be close up. Where I did those little jagged lines to make the wheat stalks kind of came out here. So you can get into playing with some artistic design, kind of draw on your bread, you know, have fun with it. Um, yeah, so there you go, golden brown. Nice and hollow. I'll, uh, for the picture on Instagram, after they're done cooling, I'll slice into it so you can see the inner crumb texture because that's really the, the winning shot. We want to make sure that um, you've got some air pockets, but not like big holes like sourdough bread. You want it to be a pretty good crumb. Good crumb texture is what we're looking for. So I will show a picture of that on Instagram after it cools down. You don't want to slice into bread while it's still too hot. Um, you'll actually kind of crush it rather than cut it, and it's just not ready for it yet. It'll be too hot to eat. So wait on it. Um, unless you're having it with dinner, and then you just tear it, I guess, and go to town. <laughs> but enjoy, and uh, yeah, let me know if you, anyone has any questions with this recipe or any other recipe. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you all again.